Welcome to Slate It for Tomorrow, a podcast where we meet inspiring individuals who found their passion, have perfected their superpowers, and can project the future. I'm your host, Sandy Sharma. And I'm your co-host, James Archery. Today, we're with our special guest, Tan May Bakshi, a certified AI prodigy who's been programming since he's five years old. We're so excited to have you on our very first episode and can't wait to pick your brain. Thank you very much. Happy to be on here and it's welcome yeah. on the first episode. Thanks. So Tan May, it's wonderful to have you on this show and thank you for joining. We want to play a little game if you're you're down for that. Kind of like a rapid fire, uh, 10 seconds to respond or less, okay? Do you drink coffee or tea? Uh, occasionally, uh, but I'm more of a hot chocolate guy. Okay. Um, what is your favorite place to vacation? Ooh, favorite place to vacation? I'd say my favorite city I've been to so far would be Mountain View. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Oh. Do you have like a, a favorite social media account though that you follow? Favorite social media account? I am a big fan of the social media accounts of Gary Marcus and Yan LeCun. What do they talk about? They are AI researchers. Oh, cool. I didn't know either. I didn't know. Uh, this is why we're not the one being interviewed for AI <laughs> generative. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, if you could master one new skill, what would it be? Master one new skill. I would say the field of linguistic psychology is really interesting. Oh, and what the hell is that? Yeah. Um, you know, Tam May, you obviously have a big presence on the internet. What's something that's unique that maybe someone wouldn't be able to figure out by you on that presence? Well, see, I was recently asked this question and... I think the uh, the most the most uh, okay the thing that most people wouldn't be able to find about me online is the fact that I am curious about a lot more things than just technology. Uh, people will see a lot of things about me online that are tech related, and I love tech. Obviously, it's the main thing I'm super passionate about. But then, apart from technology, I absolutely love the areas of pretty much everything else. Really, I, I love math. I love all kinds of science, psychology. I love looking into language. I love all these different things. And that's stuff that uh, you don't really see online all that much. I love that. I think curiosity is key, right? Because if you're not curious and you don't think about the psychology part, most of it won't apply to humans. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's cool. I mean, this kind of like bridges into our, our next segment yeah. very naturally, yeah. right? Like, uh, it's, um, what are some things that make, uh, like, that you're passionate about? I would say primarily the field that interests me most is the world of technology. And it's been that way for a very long time. Uh, of course, uh, as you mentioned, I got into the world of code and, and tech back when I was five. And the thing that really fascinated me back then, and this is sort of key to why I still love technology today, the reason that I was so fascinated by tech back then is because, I mean, you can imagine as a five-year-old, right? I'm always, I'm always just looking to play with things in my environment, right? I'm always just looking to explore, right? I'm, things are so new to me, right? I, I want to learn more. And of course, there are all these different toys I can play with. There's random things I could do. There's games I could play. But like, computers were unique to me because they're infinitely more interactive than everything else. You can do mm. infinitely more things with them than you can any other individual thing you can play with, right? And that's what really fascinated me about them. And of course, it really helped that my dad was a computer programmer. And so, uh, of course, he was able to sort of like see that curiosity and then introduce me not only to like stuff I can do on computers, but then also, hey, if you wanted it to do something and you had an idea of like what that thing was, then you can write code. And they would show me simple examples. It would be like displaying my name on screen or like adding two numbers or something simple. But that was so fascinating to me. I, could, I, I was I like, that. I want to do this and I can make the computer do this by instructing it to do so, right? That really fascinated me. And there's like, since then, it's been that sort, of, that sort of sheer curiosity that has kept that sort of growing and snowballing. And as I have continued to work more with tech, there have been additional reasons continued to sort of, that, that have continued to layer on top that I find it more and jealous more about the tipping points that happened, which caused that quantum jump in terms of your potential and where you went with your life. That, that's that's actually a really great question. I, I love that one because there were a few sort of key moments where I found that I sort of had this new perspective on technology. And I think there's two main ones that I hit. The Well, I, I would say actually, say actually three. Okay, we'll the give you three. One, the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, out three. <laughs> the, the first one was back when I was in grade three, right? I uh, was practicing for a test and I had to practice my times tables and I'm not going to lie back then wasn't that great at them. Um, and as I was doing so, uh, I realized, hey, if I'm practicing my times tables, instead of just like taking these random numbers and trying to multiply them or whatever, what if I created an application that would help me practice those times tables? And so I, <laughs> I pulled up 
my, back then I had a Windows computer. I pulled up Visual Basic. I wrote a little application. It would like generate two random numbers and ask me. And if I got it right, it would increase my score or whatever. And I built it. And just the sheer novelty that I had built this application was enough encouragement for me to continue to use that. the app and actually practice. And I got a, got a good score on the test. And so that was, that, that was one of the key moments for me, right? Uh, but then the next year after that, uh, I started to get into developing, honestly, like more kinds of tech. I finally um, got a Mac that I was really excited for. This is when I was like ending grade three, getting into grade four. Uh, this is when I was about nine, eight, nine. And I thought, wait, now I could theoretically build applications that could be distributed to many people. Oh, wow. So if that application helped me, why not also make it so it can help other people? Mm -hmm. And that was another one of those moments where it was like, hey, I can scale this up. And so I built that application. And that really sort of showed me that you can have an impact with the technology you do with, that you create as well, which sort of segues off into like another sort of inflection point on a different topic. If you go to the next one, yeah, your father helped you initially. Were there other folks or him who continued to help you see that, or did oh, you yeah. just start to realize it yourself? Like, I would say it's a little bit of um, it, it's it's been different people um, and uh, different um, I in different contexts, right? And so I would say like, of course, at first it was my dad sort of just introducing me to, hey, this is the art of the possible, mm -hmm. right? And 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 sort of answering my questions and, and keeping that curiosity growing instead of just like, oh, I don't know the answers to these questions. Nothing I can do now, right? Nice. Um, from there, it was also using the internet and books as, as, as further resources, right? And, you know, a lot of people will say like, you know, I remember back when I was like in school and people would say, hey, this stuff is like boring. But to me, it was it was insanely fun because it's like mm. there's so much you can do with this. Like, and yeah. so, actually, going to the books and the learning resources on the internet wasn't boring. It wasn't like, hey, now I got to sit through this tutorial. It was like, hey, look at this cool thing I can do thanks to the fact that I use this resource. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, if you know a nine year old is like, hey, I want to get a Mac and an iPhone so that I can develop iOS applications, right? It's that's the, uh, you know. well, you know what I like, but it's at least though you're asking because hey, I would love this to do this. It wasn't as like, mom, dad, I want a laptop. I want a yeah. cell phone. Right. It was a very clear path, I think, for them. And I think this is a great advice to anyone. Like when you want something, help show what it'll cause after the fact. It's like even when like you're fundraising, the whole purpose of fundraising is to show what money will accelerate can influence. And, and I think you even at that early age, you wrote a, for lack of a better word, a roadmap saying mom, dad, like buzzwords, right? Yeah. Mom, dad, here's my roadmap. If you get me MacBook, I get X, Y, Z. You know what's also fascinating too? I, I, as you know, I have a little bit more insight into Tanme. And Tanme, I wanted to ask you that question because you said the second inflection point was your desire to impact others. The first one was, oh, I know this. I have, I'm taking ownership of it. But right. as part of ownership, you saw you can even grow to help other people. And I think that's a really cool, it's like the whole methodology is like, if you really know the topic, you can become a teacher, yeah. right? Which then reinforces your own knowledge. So what inspired that though? Because not, not everyone just goes and thinks like, oh yeah, now I'm going to go help other people. Right. And so that's, that's, that's sort of the segue that I was, that I was talking about there is that at, at first, honestly, it was tech, technological curiosity, of course. It yeah. was, I love building tech. Then it was, hey, I can use this for myself. And then it was, hey, I love building tech and I can help other people. Win, win, right? Yeah. Um, but then beyond that, that was just like the building the application bit. After that, I realized, and it was, this is about when I was nine, that, wait, if I was able to build applications that help people, and I did so because I was able to use resources that helped me learn how to do that, what if I took the challenges that I faced using those resources and building these things and made resources that help people do these mm. as well, mm. right? Because then if you think about it, that becomes exponential in terms of growth. I'm now no longer just building things to help people. I'm building things to help people build things that will help people. Do you mind sharing one of the ways like you saw that were resources you could do that? Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, obviously the first one that, that for me at least seemed easiest and also most impactful was YouTube. Oh. I remember so many people... Uh, or rather so many different like YouTube channels were super helpful for me to get into the world of code. That was like sort of the first thing I started off with. So, yeah. How old were you when you did this? Very first tutorial, mm -hmm. like just the first thing I ever recorded was back in like 2011, like when I was like seven, eight. You were yeah. 13 or 12 though, right? Yeah. 12. Okay. Still. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So twenty. I was like seven, eight ish when I, I had my first tutorial. Like, oh, hey, nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Like the first, the first tutorial you saw was the IBM Watson stuff. We'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'd been making like iOS and like before that SQL and before that Visual Basic tutorial. Nice. While, um, and so I remember like my first tutorials um, were just basically, hey, 
I got a Mac and I found these really interesting things you can do in the terminal. Like, and it was now, I mean, looking back at it, it's relatively simple stuff. It's basically, hey, you can go into like the Apple user defaults and set settings that they won't let you normally set. Like, for example, you can set a screensaver as your desktop background, or you can enable it so you can quit Finder, or you can do X, Y, Z number of things. But whenever there's a challenge that's sort of unique to what you face, and there isn't an application for it, knowing the skill of being able to write the code to help you with that thing is very helpful then. And that's one of the things mm. that really led me to can I make YouTube tutorials? And also, honestly, though, I will add on to that one more thing is that I found that it was also helpful to learn myself mm -hmm. because in the process of creating resources that are helpful for people that don't know something, you're forced to really revise your understanding of it. Otherwise, you can't come up with a good, like, beginner level explanation of something. I have a pointed question for you on that. See, a lot of us, our curiosity is based on what we stumble upon with our circumstances, our environment, who we interact with and what get some right. mind to be curious. But if you're to really help people, it probably needs some level of research outside in. Yes. To talk to a lot of folks who could be peers, contemporaries, other folks, and then say, hey, what are your stumbling blocks? What are you curious about? Did you ever go down that path? A hundred percent. And I will say that obviously being, uh, being like seven, eight, nine, working on these tutorials and not having uh, n not even knowing what like pedagogical research is at the time, yeah. right? I wouldn't have thought of this naturally at the time. Uh, yeah. but, but now I, you have a nice fancy name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, now I can put a name to the word. <laughs> uh, I'll put a word to the concept. Um, and um, you know, at, at the time, that wasn't something I explicitly thought of. But over time, what's nice is I actually had the opportunity to do so naturally, which I found very interesting. Because what would happen is a lot of people would see my tutorials. And they would yeah. comment on it or they would email me or they would message me on Twitter. And because I'm just looking for an excuse to code, I would always um, help these people out with all these you know, yeah. different questions. And I, I still try my best to do it as much as I can. Although there's obviously a lot more people reaching out. So it's like a little bit harder to always yeah. do that. But like I, I'm trying my best. And um, uh, as I would do this, I would see all these stumbling blocks that I didn't expect people to hit. Right. Because I know what stumbling mm -hmm. blocks I hit when I was mm -hmm. learning and I would specifically make resources to try and cover those. But everybody learns differently and there's different sort of more common or average or different to every person like stumbling blocks that you'll hit. And it's become so interesting because over time you, I've been able to sort of like hone that in well enough that recently I was actually an instructor um, for an AI, uh, one year AI degree for one, one of the courses rather in a one year AI degree at University of Winnipeg. And um, at 19, by the way, <laughs> oh, <fuck laughs> God. Um, and it was really fun. What was, what was so, what was so exciting about it was there were certain points in lecture, for example, where someone would ask a question and I would be able to tell based on the way they start that question, they haven't even ended it. Right. And based on the way they start the question, I can guess, Hey, in this other course, if I had to guess your other instructor covered this thing in this way, didn't they? Yeah. And it was all, it was usually let incorrect. Me, let me give you another way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have to ask you this. Yes. You are blessed to have had the intellect, but also the environment that let yeah. you flourish. Mm -hmm. Majority of the world doesn't have Absolutely. that. So do you think that reinforcement or that liberty or autonomy to do what you wanted was a big part of the gift that you had? It, and, and how does somebody else seek that out? Because you can't seek it out. It has to be just given to you. To, That's the thing. It was absolutely what enabled it, is, is, is what I'll say. Because I feel like no matter how curious you are, it is possible for there to be um, outside of your control yeah. factors or variables that make it so that you can't do what it, whatever it is that you're passionate about, right? And that's that's a big problem, right? Yeah. And that's something that I'm not gonna lie. That's that's a much larger and much wider reaching problem than just um, than, than than anything um, that I could provide advice for, right? But but what I will say though is that uh, it's it's the responsibility not just of individuals but also communities to work together to structure things in a way mm -hmm. where people have the opportunity yeah. um, to, to, to work on what they're curious about. Because going back to what you said, right, you're curious about the things that you are actually exposed to in your environment, right? And that's yeah. one of the things that I've mentioned a, lo a, a lot of the time is that, you know, it, it's the responsibility of parents, of people in, in communities, um, of, of teachers, of the educational institutions in general a big to make it such that People are exposed to a bunch of different domains at the very least, not necessarily even going into depth, just because you can't think about whether or not you'd be actually fascinated by or passionate about something. Unless you get exposed to exactly. it. Exactly. So I want to ask you this question then, because now that we're going down the route of, uh, of fostering environments for children's education, obviously TikTok, yeah. let's be honest, yeah, right, one. Um, has had uh, a massive impact on 
uh, memory and retention span. And even before TikTok for my generation, it was, you know, uh, Facebook came out um, when I was just graduating high school. And I noticed that, you know, it started to take up more time. You know, like people had to prioritize not to spend time on it. But now there was no having to worry about scrolling fatigue yeah. and whatnot and like reels and whatnot. So, you know, um, by the way, I have to mention this in my generation, it was comic books. Oh. That's how lame it was. We had no internet of computers and phones. You know that. Yeah. Keep going. But the comic <laughs> books, the old I, guy here. And I think the thing about <laughs> comic books is, you know, they're great, but they didn't have like instant gamifications built into it necessarily to keep you still, hey, go read another comic book. It was considered a distraction. No, I true. And the amount of creativity it spawned and curiosity it spawned was actually and beautiful. That's that's the thing. But it was looked down upon. That's that's exactly what I was going to get to is like, okay. The thing about uh, platforms like TikTok and the criticisms of a lot of these platforms is that while there is a lot of validity to it, yeah. um, and there are new challenges that we face as these platforms evolve, the problem is that relative to what the past was, we will always continue to make that comparison of like, yeah. hey, this is always bad, right? Well, my, my, but my, my component, if I'm going to bring it back, mm -hmm. is... As again, you brought the response was the community. Yes, that's the thing is I don't know um, that... Hard restrictions are the way to go. Okay. Uh, what would you suggest? Yeah, I wouldn't agree. Is it? That's 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 the thing. Is in my in my opinion, you're stuck in the middle, buddy. <laughs> uh, no, I'm in the hot seat. Go ahead. When I find when you put hard restrictions on things like this, it goes too far too quickly. Agreed. And what ends up happening is you end up putting guardrails where they where there shouldn't be. And one example, a slight tangent, um, is and I'll, I'll type back in. In the in, in the EU, right? They have tons of really good yeah. protections and regulations for consumers. It's it's actually really nice. Things like what they did with GDPR, incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what they're doing with uh, standardization of, for example, the USB C port. Mm -hmm. You know, getting there that's pretty good. Um, there's a few like obviously things that would come up in my mind as a technologist of like this seems a little problematic. Please don't regulate the cable usage. But then there's provisions in law to be like, yeah. okay, if we need to upgrade and things like that, we can upgrade. So they did it pretty well. But then you start to see they're going even further. And this is where the problem of people who aren't technologists writing technology regulation comes in. Mm. And they're like, oh, what if we made it standardized so that all messaging platforms across all applications have to interoperate with each other? And so now iMessage and WhatsApp and Telegram and Facebook and all these things have to talk to each other. And then you realize you have basically devolved every platform back into SMS by doing that. Yeah, and it's like... Point. It's, yeah, and the experience that yeah. platform was trying to deliver or that uniqueness is gone. Well, so let me, you brought up an interesting unique point though, is why do you think though, the people that are writing the laws aren't technologists? And I think it has to do with what people are incentivized for, right? The people that are the technologists are the ones that are building it. Do you make more money that oh, way? Like, oh, and what's motivating the governance? Because when you see that this platform is taking off and you're seeing some, see, there will be some deviant behavior, which is not acceptable to society. Right. And everybody's standards of that varies. Mm. What is deviant to you may not be deviant to me. Right. It's acceptable. It's perfectly fine. I think we as humans have a way of self-regulating things anyway. I, I agree. Um, I do think that there are some limitations to human capabilities for governance. Yeah. You mean goodwill? <laughs> like, I mean, because here's the thing. When you bring in money, right? Yeah. It, oh, yeah. That's totally influences it's, a person. It's not even money. Money and power. It's also, it, it's also just um, raw the fact that we're pretty primitive. Like, like people think we're a lot more advanced than we are realistically, mm -hmm. right? It's, it, the brain has a good way of giving itself an illusion of intelligence. So we hallucinate on our own, like uh, the new generative AI stuff, right? <laughs> so, somewhat, somewhat. And the, the, the problem with it is that because we think we're so intelligent, we don't realize that a lot of the decisions we make are very much fueled by like subconscious processes, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you have, for example, people that do have the incentive to earn money, by leveraging the fact that we are relatively primitive and, for example, will like prefer to just spend hours scrolling through random TikToks versus actually, you know, doing anything else more productive that would have also been a release of dopamine, albeit one that would really require more effort, right? You know, that was a hot take. Tammy, it's, it's very obvious, like, <laughs> your level of intelligence, someone that's really only 19, very impressive. I mean, like, probably a lot of people want to ask that, and we were kind of, like, dancing around it, I, how did you get to where you are today, right? Like, and I, I, I for people that don't know, uh, I thought it was really cool when I met you when you were 12, how we met. T to Tammy's point, when he started building things and like building his expertise, he didn't know that he would be reached out to by someone from IBM at the time, right? 
he, he didn't, I don't think he had that intention. I think Tan May selfishly for himself was like, I need to be building content. I want to help other people and be consistent. And I, yeah, his purpose, right? And that, that was, clear. And, and I think yeah. with a lot of and things I, in life, like people didn't recognize if you're consistent with something, you know, this, then you build competencies, what, you know, that the whole thing is like, what this, what this practice builds competency within build confidence. Right. And so, um, I would ask you, you know, how did you get to where you are today? Okay, great, great, great. Yeah, he took a flight from Toronto. <laughs> That's a dad joke. You just got to let it go. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, when, okay, you, we were, we were talking about the resident, the dad and resident, the, the dad and resident. <laughs> <That's your job. laughs> sorry, Tan May. Uh, My son is older than you are, so it's okay. <laughs> oh. He's going to look at this video and be like, dad, I haven't done anything with my life. <laughs> that actually, that was like some things where like Tammy would meet people. Like they'd all be like, he's only 17 and he's a published author of four books. What have I done? Yeah. What a waster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's the way I encourage people not to look at it. And that's, that's, that's actually another discussion. So there's two things in the staff okay. that we'll get to, but, um, but, but, but yeah, what, what I was saying is we were talking about inflection points and we were talking about like how we got here. Um, and we, we've talked about a, a little bit about like, you know, sort of my, my journey. Um, but there's another angle of it, which I didn't get to. And that was sort of like the, I guess now actually fourth inflect main inflection point technically. Um, and this is actually when I met James, um, and, and James is an inflection point in a story. <laughs> it's one of my proudest moments. Uh, that was my legacy. You were that just, I have a proudly, he's sitting right here. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Whatever. We'll accept. He's jealous. You'll see. <laughs> You're just jealous. Now he's going to call this the fourth one when he does his next podcast. Oh, fair enough. Go on. Go for it. Talk about me, please. <laughs> I'm not kidding. We'll, we'll get to that part. So, <laughs> so, so what happened was, um, of course, you know, being nine and 10, I was curious about tech and stuff, making YouTube tutorials, helping out people as much as I could, you know, staying up all night, working on people's like random assignments they would email me with and be like, Hey, you helped a couple getting, paid. No, he paid for that. Was he, he helped a couple, uh, everywhere I met, he said, he's like, Hey, I'm helping someone prep for a job interview. Yeah. Tanmay was helping people. He helped literally people so are employed it was today. To get paid to take the SAT exam. No, uh, you one of those. Someone was building an app for like you for the UN uh, at one point, and they were working on an app for like helping people in a certain. Um, I forget where it was, but like if people needed help, basically we would like go through the app, and it would like send them a message and stuff. And I helped them a lot with like fixing a lot of the database level communication issues and stuff. And so like I, I've helped a lot of different people with a lot of different things. And remember back then, um, of course I was still obviously curious with tech, but it was like eventually. Yeah. I started to notice the limitations and, and, and it wasn't even just a limitation of like what you could do. You can still build tons of stuff, but like there's a fun like cut of, there's a couple fundamental, um, I guess like le f limitations at the like substrate of, of, of technology. Right. And, and one of those limitations was everything you do is based on logic and everything you do is based on human written here, are all the states your program can be in and here are the states they move into. Right. And the problem with that is that when, you look at the way that humans interact, it's infinitely more varied and complex. And when you talk to a computer, it's, it has to be an explicitly separate, different interaction. Uh, that's why when, that's why like obviously people used to be really uh, used to like using keyword level search and search engines. And nowadays they can handle way more complex sentences. Like Google uses all kinds of advanced ML in their searches now, right? Uh, but people still aren't totally used to that. So they'll still search in like keyword form and get worse results than if you were to just... Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but regardless... Uh, point is, I started to notice that limitation, and um, I was honestly just on YouTube one day, and I was on a re uh, in my recommended feed. I saw a video, and it was something like IBM Watson, the smartest computer ever built, whatever. And I clicked the documentary, and like forty minutes later, I'm like, "Wow, we can do so much more than I thought we could," because really the documentary cool. was on how IBM managed to create uh, a series of software um, that could play and win Jeopardy, yeah. and yeah. that just fascinated me i was like this is this is in, this is insane i never thought something like this could actually be done mm -hmm. and so i i heard like the keywords machine learning right and so i was immediately like i got i got to use that and so i look up ibm watson i see ibm has this cloud platform called bluemix that was the first time i heard of what cloud was now ibm cloud but yeah <laughs> i don't want to get when we built yeah um and uh that was the first time i heard of cloud that was the first time i heard of like ai machine learning tech nice i started using some of those how old were you at this time this is when i was like 11 <laughs> um and, and eventually of course i was creating tons of youtube tutorials on everything i would learn and so i was like hey i just use the watson service to put together i remember one of the first applications i built was like i took the gmail and google faq and i threw it into watson they used to call it retrieve and rank now watson discovery 
Um, That's how we met. Yeah, exactly. On that exact video. And I would ask the system questions and I show people how to call it. And I uploaded this tutorial. And apparently um, uh, a a lot of uh, folks started to not only like use the tutorial for themselves, but apparently a lot of folks within IBM started to use the tutorial as like, here's how you use Retrieve and Rank for a lot of the customers and stuff. I want to pause briefly right there. What Tanmay did subconsciously without realizing it is he identified a trend Mm -hmm. and and without meaning to necessarily, because again, he just wanted to learn how the products work. He then tagged YouTube with that product name, which had a huge marketing budget and brand behind that, which is brilliant for marketing because you're just one person. You're just this 11 and 12 year old kid. You don't have the budget to then do search engine optimization and have people come to your channel. And I would encourage people that are looking to grow their brands. Like it's very easy on LinkedIn. Like LinkedIn has his top news feed. You play, you find those feeds and write something or reshare that. And that'll get you up into the top LinkedIn news. These are way, there are plenty of tools today that you can lean into that will accelerate you with your thought around it. That's sorry. I just wanted to highlight that subconsciously. I don't think you realized it, yeah. but that that's how we can empower people today to leverage. Makes sense. You're, you're good to it. Right though. And I'm not gonna lie that I feel like that comes naturally when the thing you're working in around your brand is something you're passionate about. Yeah. With tech, right? I'm it was authentic. Passionate. Exactly. Not only was it authentic, but I'm also always wanting to be on the cutting edge because I'm always like, what else can I do? Right. And at the cutting edge, there's usually a lot of stuff that is, you know, up and coming and about to uh, about to, you know, or, or like is is um, or has that kind of marketing because that, that's that's what the cutting edge is all about. And so if you if you find the right thing at that cutting edge. Right. And you manage to create that sort of content, then that can that can that can be super valuable. Tell us a few more examples of this. You mentioned this earlier, and I just want to kind of hone in on that. Humans think and feel differently yeah. and they react on emotion and other factors when they're interacting with technology. And most technologies, as you said, are thinking logical and binary. Mm-hmm. For us to realize that thinking and feeling drives behavior and not logical wants and needs. And that is kind of been a basis of a lot of what I have done. My, in fact, interestingly, my master's dissertation was human barriers towards automation. Mm-hmm. And that was in 1990s. And from then to now, most of my work has been in how do you do innovation that actually has high human desirability? So I'd love to hear some examples where you nuanced it in a manner that it would be adopted and liked and usable for humans. I, I like I'd that. love to hear more of that. I like that. Here's the thing is, as you said, humans are, I, I, I like that way of, of, of putting it, is, is our decision making is based off of the way we feel, not the one, not what we think. Correct. Right. And that's, yep. that's one of the big things that um, is limiting even for AI, right, is Humans have the capability, like if we were to sit down here and attempt to have a purely objective discussion, right? If we were to sit down and take some sort of like fundamental mathematical principles, right, that we can boil down and improve, right? We could sit down and symbolically list out a bunch of, you know, assumptions that we make. And as long as we agree on those assumptions and the rules of building up that logic, we could sit down and symbolically create yeah. like really complex logic. Lots of answers. Right. And we can create lots of answers that yeah. way. But the problem is that doesn't scale up to other problems that affect the way we feel. When you're working on something like that, it's detached from how you feel. And so it's a lot easier to say, hey, symbolically, I can see this means this and this implies this. Therefore, I can I can also imply this other thing. Or, um, and I want to interrupt here because this is important, even though I said to you in your research that mm-hmm. this is what I would like mm-hmm. as a solution. You built it exactly that way. Mm-hmm. I still don't use it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because at the moment, I'm scared about, oh, will this alter my job? Will I be able to use it? Yep. There are all those fears mm-hmm. and anxieties mm-hmm. that exist and you don't accept change. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so there, yeah. there's more depth beyond exactly. just... It's, and it's yeah. even just familiarity. It's even just familiarity. It's different. And yeah. naturally, humans don't like different, which makes sense because as I said, we're way more primitive than we want to think, right? It's only been a at most hundred to couple hundred if you kind of stretch it you know, years yeah. that we've been living in like modern society, mm-hmm. right? And 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 even before then, it was only like, what was it? Like a hundred and something thousand years since we mm-hmm. um, split off from the other most recent human ancestor and only like, what, a couple 10,000, if I remember correctly, yeah. years since we invented written language, so like at yeah. most. And so it's like, we haven't really been doing this advanced stuff for all that long compared to the time scale of like human or rather organic like brain structure yeah. evolution, right? So it's like, we're still very primitive. Yeah. But, yeah. but, um, but if you good but, plug for the sapiens, by the way, <laughs> even if you haven't read that, have you? It, it's the phenomenal. Book? That's the thing. called sapiens. You'll need to. The illustrated book, by the way, is easier. 
the illustrated book. Sorry, he spoke in creative. Di- Tying back into our human being. Exactly. Yeah. The illustrative. <laughs> my God, Sandin. <laughs> illustrative. Um, <laughs> but, but, but that's the thing is, is that it's a lot easier to, um, to, to, to sort of reason through things when you're detached from it. It's like back to what Steve Jobs said about, you know, people don't know what they want. Yeah. And, and that's mm. one of the reasons that his approach to technology and user experience works so well is because it's not, you know, what did the customer say we, they want, deliver it. It is, what do we know they want? What will make their life better? What will they yeah. just want to yeah. use? Right. For example, one, one of the things that I like to point out is, you know, maybe a customer would say, I want my phone to, you know, have a bigger battery. Yeah. They don't want a bigger battery. Yeah. They want their phone to last longer before they need to charge it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They think they want a bigger battery. Because that's what they associate with exactly. lasting longer. Exactly. It's the so what Apple, what, what Apple the feature. Said, right. <laughs> exactly. And so what Apple instead will do is they'll say, okay, what if instead we used uh, uh, big little architecture and we made it so that we have efficient cores that are doing all the Apple tasks and that way we can put an even smaller battery, make it so that it's an even, even lighter phone, yeah. but still make it last two hours long. And charge you more. That, of course. <laughs> yeah. The other part we don't talk about. There was an interesting thing that I thought was fascinating when I learned about Steve Jobs and him creating the iPhone because originally, like, a lot of the phones were still pretty big phones, but he had kept it with, like, this form factor yeah. where if you were to hold it, your thumb... Could Good touch easy. end to end of the screen. Yeah. Nowadays, the it, you can't do that anymore. And he was, yeah. but it's also because the purpose of the phone has now changed. Yes. That's the right. Thing. Now you're re- doing way more interaction and with for work or for email, doing presentation design. Because before it would have been too small, you'd have to like really zoom in. So that design isn't really practical anymore, in my opinion. Yeah. It's like I by the way, alert. on that as products evolve and product service innovation, just one key simple takeaway, which I think is summarizes it quite well. If you go to Apple and its history, it was the MP3 streaming that they nailed initially. Okay, yes. Napster had tried to do it wrong mm-hmm. in their different ways. They fixed mm-hmm. that. There were lots of MP3 players, but nobody had done it beautifully that my grandma and my six-year-old yep. could use it. Yep. So he appealed to everybody. And that beauty is what was the minimum viable product to bring Apple back on. Absolutely. And on, now over time, look at how many things it does, but it's added on yeah. slowly. Absolutely. Now, if you think about from that one, if they jump to what it is now, mm-hmm. it would never have worked. Agreed. So you do incremental improvements based on hard data that you're getting on usage and customer feedback. And if you stay true to that and not to your vision, you'll actually always and, be and, and also the, the other sticking point was the fact that he was able to secure licensing agreements with... You all, had to. You had to, yeah. Because, because it has to be easy, yeah. enjoyable, and useful. And have the what people wanted. So that's right? it. Which it's was all the same thing. You can't, you, exactly. I have my access to all the songs. It's not connected, disconnected. Is it synced, not synced? Yeah. Is it plugged in properly or not? Does it sound beautiful or not? Do I have to worry about the licensing or not? All that was taken care of. Yeah. And But we only nailed music. Yep. Right? So you nail that and only then do you start to scale and then you start to come back and look at what else you want to shape next. Mm-hmm. So it's that shape, nail, scale. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Which always works. Absolutely. But very few companies actually do it. And also integrate. And also, inter- it's like well, it's- those are so the way I think about it is above the line or front stage is the experience you're delivering, which always has to be beautiful. Oh, yeah. Whatever we are talking about is all backstage. Mm-hmm. Like when you actually go to theater, yeah, it's the show you're enjoying. Yeah. At the back, it's a friggin' mess. Yeah. <laughs> the lights are not working. Yeah. Uh, the actor didn't show up. The makeup artist is not here. Yeah. I ripped my costume. <laughs> Who cares? The show must go on and it has to be a beautiful show. Yeah. So I think that's the mentality that's different about And it's all back to that. Human desirability. Yep. Yeah. People are there. What want matters, a beautiful show. What matters is what you, what deliver. you deliver. So, um, want to get more into AI? I, 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 AI. I do. I know. Yeah. I think we got a really good. This kind of leads us to, I think, the the fourth inflection point. You know, so you found your interest in, in IBM Watson. Yep. I reached out to you. We then built a relationship. Got you connected with the product teams. You know, then you got complete exposure because you're based out of Toronto. Toronto, uh, Canada was kind of like a bubble from the mm-hmm. tech world. But then you got on our international global company, IBM at the times main stage now the whole world kind of knew about you and then you did a world tour with them like you know going and speaking all over the country and then we did our web series you know tammy uh ibm watson made civil with tammy bakshi yeah um but you know now that we're here like what, are, what which element of the future are you most interested in or inspired by now there's so much happening that it's hard to pin it down to one overall though i am most interested in the research Okay, uh, from a technical angle, uh, the, the word for it is neurosymbolic uh, AI. Uh, but 
what that means is you dumb that down yeah. all of us. Yeah. <laughs> well, what that means is a combination of the approach that is popular today and the approach that I think and a lot of other researchers think will bring us to truly more useful and productive AI applications. Um, and it's, it's as, a, as a very brief sort of, um, I guess, one liner into what that means. Today's approaches are fully end to end, right? There's no control over them. The old approaches that we had towards AI were fully controllable and algorithm based. So we'd write out rules. Like, for example, if we want to play chess, then we'd write out like, here, here's the way we evaluate the boards. These things are good. These things are bad. Here's how we search through all the different possible combinations. Then we'd make the computer play chess. And clearly the old symbolic approaches are nice for controllability. If you want it to play a certain way or if you want it to uh, work within specific constraints, it works very well. But the new way is has way higher fidelity on complex unstructured data, things like natural language and vision and audio. And the problem is, how do you bridge the gap? Because they are fundamentally, inherently incompatible architectures. So how do you merge the two is a very interesting question. So in the chess example, what would the new way be? The new way for chess is very fun. I, I love this story. So have you heard of AlphaGo by chance? Either of you? Yeah, of course you have. Go. So uh, do you, have you looked into how it works at all? No. No, no. That's why we're happy with you. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So basically there's, there's a couple stages to it. And I'm going to uh, really briefly um, cover the whole thing. We start off with an AI system that doesn't know how to play chess or Go rather in this case, right? What happens is this neural network makes completely random moves right? It doesn't know anything about Go. We take the neural net and we have it play against itself. At first, these games are terrible. But the way we do it is we wrap this neural network in the old way of doing it. So we take this neural net and what it's responsible for doing is saying, what moves do we think are best and how good do we think a certain board state is, right? We have it do a bunch of search using an old technique. And here's the thing, mm. no matter how bad the neural network is, no matter how bad it is, Wrapping it in the old technique will make it slightly better, better than the just slightly better than itself on its own. Is that called? And that's is that is you know we heard this term supervised unsupervised learning. Is that an example of one of those or no? Uh, no, not yet. This isn't the training bit. Okay, uh, this is just using the network, right? So like if you just use the network on its own to play Go, versus if you use the same network but wrapped in a little bit of that old logic called Monte Carlo tree search, is what it's mm -hmm. called. Yeah, you put the two together, two together will be slightly better at least, right? Okay. It has to, it, it mathematically will be. So you take two of this own neural network, augmented, mm -hmm. make it play against itself. That means the games that it played are slightly higher quality than it itself would see. Mm. So you take that, you use it as training data, now you have a better network. This better network is wrapped around is wrapped around that old technique, and made to play against rating. itself, and you keep going and going and going, and every time you make slightly, slightly and slightly higher quality training data, and you keep doing that until the network is just really good. And at that point, you then, once again, wrap it around in that old Monte Carlo tree search wrapper and you make it play Go and it's learned these superhuman strategies that have just been gained over hundreds and thousands of years and it of beats playing Go. any coding you could have done. Yeah, by far, by far. It beats humans and, you know, before that there was no chance of a system beating a human and this thing just smokes every human, right? Yeah. And then eventually uh, Google went a step further and they said, okay, there's one part of the previous one that I actually left out. The previous pipeline was actually we take this network and we start by training it on a bunch of human Go games. So it's a, it has a little bit of knowledge, right? Yeah. It's not that good though. And then we do the iterative process and it gets really good. Next, they said, okay, what if we just let it learn completely on its own, starting from random? Don't and that it all. learned even better because it didn't have any kind of human bias to begin with. And also they trained it for a lot longer and used more advanced architecture and stuff. But starting with no human knowledge it did even better than the last one mm. and then they had more advanced versions that like didn't even know the rules and couldn't even do tree search and a bunch of other things and those work even better um but it seems to be the more human you remove from the equation the better, the better the systems do a lot of the time uh, that's uh, the scary part uh, that's uh, the scary part uh, uh, but <laughs> there, there, there's there's a lot of reasons for that but uh, <laughs> a lot of reasons why you should remove humans from this region. what they, are you a robot the machines are taken over no, that, that he's saying this so that way when they watch this play this podcast, <laughs> Tanmay is an ally of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's one of the things I appreciate about Tanmay. Like he started learning when he was five to program. So, and then eleven machine learning. So these things he started learning at like learning other sports and geography and all this other stuff. So it's like very good mastery of it. Um, you know, how do you 
envision the work that you just talked about impacting what you're doing today with your, let's say your job. So do you mean uh, how this sort of AI is impacting building like, AI or just work in general? No, impacting the world, business, yeah, the society, society, right, right. five years, culture, any of just go so, anywhere. That's the thing is there is what uh, people want to hear. And then there's what I think the actual impact will be, right? What, what a lot of people seem to think, yeah. what a lot of people seem to think is... This is an authentic podcast. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's exactly that, what... No, 100%. <laughs> that, I, I, that's, like, that's exactly why I want to bring up the contrast, though. That's exactly why I want to bring up the contrast, because there's what people think I would say here, and then what I would actually say. And I want to get to both, right? And... Um, I just started to introduce his personalities. We keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and... So the thing about um, a lot of the modern AI tech is that it is uh, it is um, very good at giving you the illusion of intelligence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, one of the things that I like to point out is that humans are naturally very, very biased towards thinking that anything is intelligent, right? <laughs> we will look at a satellite picture of a rock on Mars and be like, wow, that looks like a human face. And then we'll get more details of it. Why, and why is that? I'll get to that, actually. That's, that's a fun one. Yeah. Um, and actually, no, this is the reason. It's because if you look at it from an evolutionary perspective, humans have incentive, first of all, to try and look for lifelike features wherever they can, mm -hmm. right? If you're in the wild and you aren't sure if something behind a bush is an animal or not, it's, it's better to, to eliminate towards the, the side. No, it's to give you fear. No, but for the, and you quickly want to check off this one. Is right, sure, down, sure, down. sure. So you sure. want to yeah, quickly yeah. eliminate those. So go through the possibilities, yeah. but you go through the possibilities because of the fear of the thing that Correct. Correct. That's what drives it. Right. That's um, what drives And that's, that's Hence why, like, even like ancient mythology, they thought, you know, there are gods that we're controlling the rising of the sun yeah, and the setting yeah. of the sun to give you we're some biased. Yeah. Right. It's because we're it's because we're biased from a psychological perspective. And what's what's interesting uh, about that is like for example uh, if you take a look at uh, when 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 people use computers mm -hmm. right? even if they're doing a structured menial task that has nothing to do with language or communication if you look at scans of their brain while they're doing it the same parts of their brain that deal with other human and animal interactions are the ones responsible right. for driving computer interaction, yep. mm -hmm. right? And what's really fascinating about that is to your brain at a subconscious level, there is no difference between using a computer or talking to a human, right? At a subconscious level, you are still treating it the same way. Point. Now, processing it the same way. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. That makes sense, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah. people, people don't realize how biased their subconscious thoughts are. And here's, here's a really fun experiment that I love. I don't... Um, I'm going to try and remember the, the details, but I love it. Um, it's some, uh, some, okay, some people when they're born, if they have um, seizures and, and, and things, what, one of the common procedures to do to fix it is to um, split the part of the brain that connects the two halves. Um, and so what, effect, what that effectively means is that you have two separate brains in your head that don't communicate. Um, and that, that sort of fixed it. Like if you, that, I had no idea. What? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. And if they, they're, they work perfectly fine, just like, but um, what's, uh, here, here's what's really interesting about that. First of all, when you're born, you're born with way more neurons than you actually need. Like slowly your brain will prune off the ones that you don't need, right? Like, for example, if you were to today, um, if I were to show you like two chimpanzees, right? Um, based off of their faces, it would, you'd probably take a while to like recognize between them. Like you're not good at primate facial recognition. You're good at mm -hmm. human facial recognition. Mm -hmm. primate. But as a baby, you're amazing at it. You're just as good oh. as the actual champs. But the thing is, you never need to use those neurons. They're never mm -hmm. actually exercised. And so your brain just gets rid of them over time. Wow. Because it needs, it, why spend all those extra resources, right? And um, I think that goes back to then why, like, they talk about how it's so important at an early age, introducing learning different languages yeah. and yeah, plasticity. Yeah. A huge part of that. Uh, interacting with animals. Or like all of that. Anime at five years age got introduced to computers. Precisely. And the problem, and which explains why your, your brain chose to keep the neurons and allowing you to have like a faster ramp up to that tech stack. Mm -hmm. Good point. But and that's why even the digital natives, the way they interact with technology and how they're able to process yeah. it and move fast. Yeah. It's crazy. Like 100%. there's yeah. two things I'm leading to. First of all, people are very biased to find intelligence where there is none. Okay. And what this means for AI is that, for example, if you talk to ChatGPT mm -hmm. or if you use any of this new generative AI especially because the modality of data is language because you're speaking to it in a form of data that is specifically architected to be able to represent abstract thought right and decision making 
because of that and because they've been able to figure out a good mathematical distribution for that language, you will think it is intelligent uh, subconsciously, even if it's not. You will inherently subconsciously be biased towards thinking it can do way more math, way, way more things. Um, uh, but 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 point is, uh, humans suffer from this this idea of 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 effectively just going with what they are, you know, seeing subconsciously, which may not have all the details or all the nuance, right? And and being convinced of it. Mm-hmm. And language models suffer from the same thing, right? If I were to, for example, today um, go to ChatGPT. Uh, maybe not ChatGPT because um, it, it just has way too many restrictions in place in general. Um, but like, if you were to go to like one of these regular lo- language models, um, and if you were to, for example, make uh, a couple sentences that assert something about like uh, scientists finding unicorns in Argentina, I think was one of the examples, and like give it a bunch of like completely physically impossible like traits, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it will just fully like continue this news article as if it's nothing and, and talk about like the scientific principles for why this uh, gravity defying thing might work. And we said to give us an example of XYZ and cite sources. Mm-hmm. And the, they gave fake URL links. So they made up sources to like Stanford University. And, 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 and awesome. when we clicked on all the links, it looked legit. And then when you clicked on all of them, it says 404, not found. 404, <laughs> page not found. Nothing like on it, but went to like the the website of so-and-so company. And and I'm like, whoa, that's dangerous. And uh, that's that's a class that happens all the time. Because think about it, right? Like you're taking 400 gigabytes of internet data and you're using it to make a tiny model compared to that 400 gigabytes, right? right? It's a tiny, tiny model. It can't contain all the data. So what's it going to do? It's going to try and just store general patterns that are useful in making that data. The majority of our news and information is also made up anyway. So it's short. Yeah, I think it's conforming well. (laughs) If it's picking it up from me, where did you find this? I found it on the internet. (laughs) There it is. I have added. I found it on the internet. And And how many people go to the second level click and see that it's a 404? They don't. They don't. They don't. So and. We got to have some really good understanding in terms of what's real and not real. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, today, yeah. we're just so headline driven. Yep. We don't ever actually. Oh, it's, that's exactly that's what it, it is. Because the objective these models are trained on is, did the human like the conversation? <laughs> yes or no? And it's like, even if you were to provide a better sort of um, objective, uh, for example, was it factually correct? Problem is you're still not solving a more inherent limitation, which is the models don't have external input. That's why uh, applications like the Bing um, Bing Chat are, are, are so innovative, not because conversational AI, not because of large language model, but because they've managed to make it so that you can take large scale, internet scale, a mm-hmm. corpus of data and make it accessible and uh, make it, uh, make, put it in a form where it can be analyzed by these models. Despite the fact that they have this like very hard context window length limitation, make it so that these models can analyze this long form data. But they make problems for the developers that are watching this. So Tanme, it's been very entertaining so far and brilliant. Thank you. I would love to have you answer the question in terms of what are your superpowers? How do you see them? Maybe how you see them, or how the world sees them. I don't know, but okay. I'd love to hear that answer. That's 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 a great question. Um, I, I think what I love to do is, 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 in, is, is insanely varied. And because of that, it's very hard for me to hone down, like, uh, I guess superpower, but I guess uh, what I, I would rather boil that down to things that I am passionate about, things that I enjoy and have spent enough time in to gain the expertise in is what I would really boil that down to. Right. And, uh, there's obviously like the, the, the more obvious technical one that I could, that I could say. Right. And, and one of the things that I have honestly been working towards and still working towards, but I think I've gotten um, uh, gotten good at over the years is being able to take some sort of complex technology concept and break it down into here's how we, um, it, here is an intuitive explanation for the reason things are done this way and how you can take an unrelated problem and build similar intuitions for this problem. I love that. I love that love your, your superpower is the ability to take complex complex you know uh ideas solutions and make it bring it down to the most simplistic state how do you do you think that was a nurture versus nature thing like how did that happen good question yeah i thought that's why i asked him <laughs> he's got to validate himself <laughs> hey 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 
I love you, Johnny. Buddy. That I, was awesome. I, I love you. I love you too. Come here. Come here. Yeah. Let's let's bring Good. it. I guess that boils down to your uh, <laughs> question of what is nature and what is nurture. But anyway. oh, 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 well. there we go. Speak of this turns back. <laughs> I'm not going to go on God here. I'm not going to go on a whole tangent here, but I will say um, that it was partially the fact that obviously I've done it for long enough. Like I have been answering people's questions and working towards and work towards helping people for so long that it's experience that I've gained over time that like if someone asked this question, you were always like, a teacher. <laughs> yeah. and, and 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 the thing and, is, and not just the teacher but he really wanted to make it easy and simple for them so that that is the superpower and uh, and i think also to tame like if i will lead the witness here um i this is my bias opinion of why i think this is the case i think it, it stems on at the age you learned mm-hmm. and took interest that's what i was gonna say good be, point because you being five years old mm-hmm. you didn't have college in in high school educational background and understanding of it it's not dumb so it, you had to simplify it back to the albert einstein phrase it was like if you don't understand something at a 12 year old level you're not a master of something here's here's the way that i described it actually um is if you look at uh for example the way i built software when i was seven right or or even <laughs> even or even like going up to like was seven like 14 right mm-hmm. i don't understand the idea of time scaling complexity I can't sit here and tell you what big O notation is and why binary searches and log n. Like, I can't tell you these things, right? But naturally, to achieve the things I wanted to achieve, those were the ways I had to figure out to do things. Huh. And in doing so, I built a good intuition for what these things are called and then eventually, or for, or for what these things do. And then eventually, looking at structured resources, I'm like, oh, so that's called binary search. I remember I was once building a, a, a number guessing game app. And I was like, okay, what's the most effective way to actually guess the number? Like, least number of guesses. I mean, and I intuitively thought, well, if you split in the middle and you keep splitting, keep splitting. that's the best. Way. And eventually I'm like, oh, wait, that's just called binary search. Mm. And like, uh, yeah. So, so let me play it back what I'm hearing. Right. And this is, this is the way I'm hearing it. Right. There is a way to make things simpler and, you know, keep trying to solve the problem mm-hmm. and also share that with the world because you found it to be simpler. 100%. But there is a bigger superpower element here, which I see that you were always maniacally focused on solving the problem. Yes. Yeah. Regardless of what obstacles came your way. 100%. Don't limit yourself and silo yourself the role or the exactly. track you were told to be on. Yeah. Because if you said, I'm not an infrastructure guy, if I'm having issue with storage, I'll talk to the infrastructure guy. Exactly. I'm the front end developer, right? And people say, I'm a full stack developer. I'm a full problem solver. If you really are, Anything that comes your way is something you got to tackle or handle yourself or find other expertise from people who can solve it. But you can't just say, okay, I'm throwing in the towel or I'm waiting for somebody else. That, I think that that attitude yeah. is key. It's it. That's what makes you dumb it down, simplify it, keep at it, go down the rabbit hole. So that is a bigger piece of your superpower, I think. That is the highlight, I think, here is it is specifically when you encounter an issue when you have a problem to solve being able to say i will go through the full stack of solving it yeah and even if it's not stuff that's related to what you do necessarily right even if you get help from domain experts in the other ones while doing it being involved in it and helping helps and the reason for it is because innovation isn't can't happen well it's like can't happen like mm-hmm. as we innovate more and more innovation isn't really as impactful with an individual domains. It's at the intersections of them. It is. Right? It's like you innovating purely in machine learning and saying, hey, I just found a better generic XYZ technique isn't nearly as impactful as saying, hey, I found this really interesting technique that can help us do this, solve this other problem in this domain, right? And, uh, and then that, that then cross-pollinates so across so many others. Here at key. Indigo, we call it the indigo magic. <laughs> and we force the creative design people. Yeah the business consulting people, the technologists to actually work together. Amazing. That by itself that. is hard. I love that. Plus, they don't respect each other, don't understand each other. Yeah. But if you're given the same problem and the team's job is to solve the problem. Yeah. Now, if that becomes your bigger purpose, then you will you go out and solve it. Yeah. I think that's and it's great... very hard. It's very hard. Well, I think it comes down to like, I mean, even humans, right? They uh, look at our country. They're so divided on what problems to solve on. And they're like, no, this is problem is the priority problem. Yeah. Even though they all it, are well intentioned, in wants to solve, us. they all want to solve problems. It's just they can't unify on. It. Or like even back in my role in sales, is like some people in tech look at a salesperson like, ah, you're just in sales, you're just trying to make a buck. Um, but I like the fact that I went into sales coming from a consulting background first. You're actually solving problems. I wanted to solve the problem first, yeah. and and I think it, the the key message is remove your ego at the door. Mm-hmm. 
right? If you remove the ego at the door, the problem is the primary focus. And then it doesn't matter about- and it's bigger than you, yeah. or your team, or your company. Yeah. I think that's the part that, like-, like Or the country, and your example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if I can, uh, go ahead. Yes, you can. I, I oh, you're the guest, by the way. You get to speak. Please say. Um, uh, you may not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, go on. Okay. On. <laughs> No. Sorry, I'm sorry. But he's not a conformist. He listened to you. I know. Uh, All right. Good. It's because I have an unfair advantage. I've been his big unofficial brother for like that's not how many years now? Seven. Yeah. Okay. Ignore the dude. Tell okay. us which person. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um. But no, no. What I was saying is that uh, precisely the idea of like having to remove your ego and actually focus on solving the problem is incredible, and that is that is exactly what people should do. Problem is that businesses usually aren't structured that way. That is a huge issue. For example, a lot of, uh, a little while ago, one of the teams that I work with, uh, they were considering uh, sort of measuring developer like quality and productivity on, I'm not joking, number of lines of code commits and pull requests into the repo. Not quality. And I was immediately like, not at all. That does not make any that makes not sense. Mike and Iota of sense, yeah. Yeah. right? At that point, you have transformed the culture of this team from like collaborative, solving problems, working with each other, just just spewing out to being like to becoming a factory, yeah, code, just throwing out most like bad code you can, right? Yeah. And it's like that's like, the thing you the, have the incentives to be are wrong. Good at building metrics and and incentives. That's the problem. You can't have people that are detached from work looking at numbers. You have to have executives. You have to have business people and managers who are actively attached to work, qualitatively looking yeah. at yeah. quantitative. Can I just say something? I really love that. The, that's a brilliant example. It'll, it segues directly into what Mark Zuckerberg recently just said, which Mark Zuckerberg was basically saying, there were too many managers now in between the actual products and the work being done. And so, you know, unfortunately, you know, people- the layers at They're, they're, they're yeah. moving those layers and requiring managers to actually re- go back into coding again so that they can have direct feedback with their teams. Yep. Fair. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that's a really hot take, which then kind of leads us into an awesome segue around, you know, headline hot takes. So, Sandy, pick one. Pick it. All right. Okay, and I just want your reaction to these. All right. Organoid uh, intelligence could create brain cell powered computers. It's a very interesting domain. I believe they were able to take a culture of human neurons and teach it to, uh, if I remember correctly, fly a plane in a flight simulator. Um, it's very powerful technology. I can't wait to see what they do with it. I don't think there's anything unethical about it personally. Um, and well, I mean, depends on obviously how you collect the cells to cultivate to begin with. That's a whole other thing. But like actually doing the process of that cultivation is is, is fine in my opinion, should be allowed and uh, it's not as problematic as people think it is. And has something good for the future. Precisely. Sounds like AI again, yeah. trying to get their way. <laughs> All right, my hot take. <laughs> Microsoft's new AI chatbot has been saying some crazy and unhinged things. Uh, well, yes, it has been. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in my opinion, I didn't... Know I, yeah. uh, I fully expected that to happen. Uh, that wasn't... Uh, I would be surprised if it didn't. And also, it goes back right back to the same... Uh, I forget who said this, um, but they're absolutely correct when they said, um, if we... Uh, right, right now, you can ask a large language model about a story where AI takes over the world and it'll, it'll, be, it'll look like super convinced that it's angry that humans or whatever... But if we happen to train it on the entirety of the internet without any stories of AI being angry, it would never have generated that. So it, it's all older what it's got. In. It is yeah. just a language model, not intelligent. Okay. <laughs> okay, here's another one. OpenAI launches an API for ChatGPT plus capacity for enterprise customers. Yeah, that's that, an API I was actually messing around with yesterday. Love the, uh, love the idea. That's what I've always said. OpenAI's main innovation isn't even the language models. It is the infrastructure and the software to run those language models at scale for developers. And so I'm super excited by it. But what do you think commercialization will do? I think commercialization means that more developers are going to get easy access to very advanced capabilities that they can actually deliver. Mm-hmm. And OpenAI, my thoughts on OpenAI are different. In my opinion, OpenAI isn't uh, the greatest example of um, a company working on uh, research purely for good. Uh, they, their, 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 their mission at the beginning was definitely that. Yeah. Um, but the problem is that I think over time it's turned more into 
for lack of a better way of putting it, using that mission as uh, a way to scale the commercial end of OpenAI, yeah. right? And 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 in, in, kind of like Tom's shoes, they're going to give everyone a pair of shoes. But <laughs> but and this is what always happens with any cause started just for good. It gets to a tipping point where it's meaningful, right? And if you don't add commerce to it, you can't get the scale. So but that's the that's thing. how capitalism works. I I agree with that. And and the thing too about that is that there are tons of researchers at OpenAI that may still purely have that objective as a thing, right? There are tons of researchers and individual people at OpenAI that are, I'm sure, still working towards that mission. But at the same time, the uh, the actual science could have been done in a more open way, right? Yeah. And their secret sauce is how do you deploy? What's the infrastructure? Yeah. What, what are your training objectives? What's your data? What's your yeah. computer? That's the secret sauce. So as long as the kernel yeah. of that remains, yeah. you, you could. Yeah, uh, Tana and May and I are talking about this, but how... Uh, the like at universities, the people are incentivized to work with universities to research papers because then it gets published and whatnot at OpenAI now. Um, they're keeping all of that truth inside, which uh, that wasn't the case. The, originally, their premise, their precipice was about how do we open it, it was too powerful for one person to own, hence Makes why sense. Google came out with TensorFlow and opened it up to the world. And also, Google a while back was like, actually, you know what, we probably shouldn't go with large language models initially yeah. to the public and whatnot just because it's not safe. So just relax. We are going to actually get into the section of what are you projecting for the future. Got it. And in that section, I'd love for you to share stories of what you're working on. Because that might be the best way to tell us what future are you working on and sure. tell us what you project. Well, more appropriately, Tan May, you know, it, what do you think the future looks like? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a lot of fun different projects. Uh, one that I'm working on at IBM right now. Uh, is a project where we're automating the McDonald's drive through for example, right? Um, and what this means for the future, I think, is is there's what a lot of people seem to think, and there's, there's what actually I think is going to happen. Obviously, the, the immediate reaction is, hey, AI in general, like through the example of this project, but also just like in general, is like replacing our jobs and like people are moving out of these domains and, we're, and this is a problem, right? And of course, it's a problem. There's stuff that needs to be done to ensure that people, you know, continue to have work in the future, but the point is, AI is not replacing the vast majority of like actual creative in creative jobs effectively, right? People uh, misunderstand what creativity is a lot of the time, um, and even at the scale of something like a you know Watson order is what we're doing with automating the drive-through. If you look at actually talking to the franchisees, right? If 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 you if you if you talk to them, you start to realize that they physically can't fit enough people in the back of these McDonald's. Mm. And they actually want this system so that people can be making the food yeah. and preparing orders, yeah. not that just sitting there taking orders, right? Well, even the making of the food will... Eventually, yeah. Go yeah. Into absolutely, there's, absolutely. There's but that's probably nothing wrong with that. But but absolutely, I, I actually fully agree with yeah. that. And the reason I... The, what I'm trying to get at is that it's a phased approach. It's not like tomorrow we're going to wake up and suddenly every McDonald's is automated 100%, no more humans in any fast food restaurant or cashier. That's not, that's not how it works. It's going to be phased. It's going to be gradual. So slowly people lose their jobs. Well, yeah, but yeah, new I, jobs keep emerging. Right? Uh, I, 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 like horse-driven carriages before the cars came around. Precisely. Let lots of people learn how to and drive. I'm just going to play devil's drive. advocate so people won't. No, you're absolutely <laughs> that's what right. You're absolutely yeah. right. But here's the thing. Not only do more jobs come up, the thing that I love about technological progress is the old jobs that are replaced and the new jobs that come up are respectively, jobs that we should never have done and more jobs that we should be doing. Fair. And and the reason I say that is because... And we say should be doing. I think it, it, there is a certain amount of drudgery in some of the jobs. Things that are highly repeatable, and we know this, whatever is highly repeatable, has drudgery, can be replaced with a computer. Sh- in my opinion, should. But our human brain, which is capable of so much more, could actually explore those things now because you don't have to do the drudgery is how I always see that as a great thing for the future, right? 100%. If you keep that in mind, it's kind of the renaissance. Right? It's back to the arts, back to creativity. You don't have to be a STEM student only. Yeah. I mean, think about that. 100%. How many people have the ability to create and design, I do create, that. bring beauty to our world, which were forced, hey, no, my son, I want you to do STEM. Like, no, just yeah. to explore what all you can, your brilliant mind can do. Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree with that. It's like, there's, there's, there's so much we can, we, we can do, and it's, it really just depends on that creativity, right? Yeah. And 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 humans weren't meant to do this sort of repetitive, redundant task. I think driving is a perfect example. Right? It is. It's like yeah. we weren't meant to drive cars. Yeah. Like there's this one render that this universe put together of like the humans if they evolved to survive car accidents, and it looks like a totally just like it's a really weird, really weird render. 
Um, and, you know, like we're one of the only animals with blind spots in our eyes. No, yes, and yeah. just like and horse racing right. and owning horses, right. owning a car that actually does not drive itself will be... It'll be, it'll be a novelty. Exactly. It'll be a novelty. Exactly. Exactly. It'll, be, yeah. it'll be a niche. I'm and, not and giving up mine is. ever. I don't blame you. <laughs> and the thing is, and, and the thing is, I think it's a good thing because more and more we want people to be working in domains where they're adding actual innovative value, yeah. right? And and not necessarily, and I'm not saying that what they're doing right now isn't important. It's key. That's not what I'm trying to say because if they weren't doing, if people that are doing yeah. these redundant things aren't doing what they do, yeah. everything else would collapse. But I would rather they also work on this stuff so they yeah. can continue to... I think it's liberating right. in a way. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's how I look at That's it. That's how I see it as well. Of course you would. Um, <laughs> so, Tanmay, I think we've learned a lot. This has been a very healthy conversation. I'm definitely full for people to take away. Where could they get started to learn about machine learning and generative AI? What are some great places? Let's first start there. Thank you. And so, not just for the geeks. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So, yeah, I, I, I try to make my content as accessible as possible. Yeah. Um, and there, there's, just, there's honestly lots of different places you can go to learn about different um, advanced technologies. Uh, of course, there are um, there's, there's the, the resources that I've worked on um, that range all the way from, you know, not very technical, how to use the tech, all the way down to here's implementation details. Of so where do they go for that? So um, there's my YouTube channel. Tanme Teaches is a great way to take a look. We'll, uh, we'll make sure to post it in the link below and post it on screen. Keep Thank going. You. Uh, there's also, of course, um, my social media where I post all sorts of different fun new projects that I'm working on. My GitHub, uh, all those um, handles will be on screen as well, um, as well as my Coursera course on getting into the world of artificial intelligence. My segment there is particularly around... Uh, what exactly AI means for applications and how you can get into it and use it. So I think that would be really valuable to those who don't necessarily need all the technical details. So to check that out, um, as well as if you're interested in more of the actual implementation, my books are also super useful, I find, um, because they precisely try to at least teach in that way of like, here's an intuition and here's how you build towards it. Um, And so I I find that to be valuable. How much of the language models are you using now and are going to use for your future authoring? That's a great question. I'm curious. Or not just language, other AI as well. I'm right? curious to see how much I use it for authoring. If I'm being honest, it'll probably be helpful for the mundane sections. So for example, <laughs> back to that, it'll, 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 it'll be helpful for like, here's a bunch of like, like for example, when say, it's a, say like an about the author section, right? I'll say, here's a bunch of things I've done, right? A simple about the author. Or, that's the mundane oh, section. Yeah, that's the mundane. Was that the mundane section? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> But I get what you're saying. And like, maybe I want to write a book about this now and I need it to be this long of pages. What should the outline be? Like, right. Get you started. Like, yeah. This chapter. What were the key yeah. learning outcomes? Right. Like writing that sort of stuff is like the part as an author where you're like, I've already done the actual content, but now I got to write this too. And yeah. like that, that's the part that I feel like. Or, cool. or, you know, like, as you've told me before, like sometimes when you were writing a book, like you, you end up writing more right. than what the book is supposed to yeah. be. And so you say you, it's supposed to only be 80 no, that, back, right? Yeah. But then he could say to the AI, which I've done before for a certain, like even just emails and whatnot, hey, make it 50% more concise. Are you saying you're bobos? <laughs> I have my moments. I have my moments. <laughs> Definitely not today. Because I'm in awe of this guy. Damn is there anything else you want to plug um, for people to get up to speed on like what what you're doing um, or what else? Or just- uh, my Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube channel, and my books are the main things I want to plug, and that's where people can keep track of what it is that I'm doing, and of course my uh, my my GitHub for all the developers out there. Love it, Damn <laughs> Well, I'm really excited to see what the future holds for generative AI, and also I'm pretty sure all of us are excited to see what the future holds for you. Thank you. Thank you so much Thank for coming on us or ensuring. Very glad to be here. It's been a very fun discussion. I got to talk about a lot of things that uh, usually don't get to talk about. So very fun. Thank you very much. Very uh, honored to be the first uh, first guest on the show. And for those listeners, we're okay. going to make sure to have all the all these nuggets available to you as part of the show notes at the end of the show. Stay tuned for that um, and uh, stay tuned for our next episode. Yeah, thank Here's you. Signing Bye. off. Signing off. Bye.